ahead and start recording. Okay, I will call this uh, September 7 meeting of the board, board of Directors of the Waller, Summit Waller Community Association order. And first item is the August 3 meeting minutes. Does anybody have any comments and additional changes? Do we have a motion to adopt the uh, meeting minutes from August? I'll move. Second. Okay, so we have, uh, it's been moved and seconded. We adopt the uh, August 3 meeting minutes. All in favor? I, I, I'm having dinner right now. It just got served <laughs> up, so that's why I got the photo for now. Okay, uh, August treasurer's report. And do we have Mr. Reed on here somewhere? Uh, Reed, Mr. Reed is not here. Okay, yeah, I don't, I'm never quite sure if I've got all the panels on my screen or not. Okay, so we'll put off the August treasurer's report until next month. Um, so then the webmaster report. All right, so um, a couple items. I got some back talk on Angela's. All right, so um, so webmaster report um, traffic is uh, to the website a little bit down. We've got new, uh, actually quite a steady flow of new people onto the uh, Facebook group. Um, that does bring to uh, the forefront the topic of uh, getting more involvement through the board that are there. Um, right now, it's me and Angela, and every so often. Uh, Don will pop in and say a couple of things, but mostly it's Angela and I. Um, I think it might be good for those of us even Facebook adverse to maybe join at minimum just so they can keep a pulse on the goings on of our community and their interests. That'd be really good to uh, have those people involved, even if it's just on that level alone. I know Facebook is the devil. And I agree with that sentiment, but um, you know, you don't have to. You don't have to go down the rabbit hole. You can just stay in the group, and that's it. So, I really would encourage all board members to please join our Facebook community group to make sure that we can stand that. Um, but other than that, everything's been smooth sailing. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Gabe. Yes. Yeah, I would just like to say that uh, um, more board mem members need to contribute items to the important news of the month. You know, I mean, if pe if we expect people to go to our website uh, more than once, uh, we need to have updated notices or short articles submitted by our board members to Gabriel uh, for Larry. To Larry, actually, that's going to come up if you take a look down under new business. We're going to discuss the website. Okay. So, All right. So if you can save those, that'll be the time for it. Okay. Got it. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. All right. Then we will move on to current business. Uh, Canyon Road update. Lakeisha Neal, take it away. All right. Great. Uh, Jenny, do you have uh, mm -hmm. capability to share your screen? Not yet, Gabe. You should now. Okay. There it is. Okay. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, thank you all for having us here to talk about the Canyon Road Regional Connection Project. For those who don't know me, my name is Letitia Neal. I'm the Transportation Improvement Manager for the Office of the County Engineer. I am joined today by Brian Johnston. He is one of our environmental biologists working on the project. And Jenny is with PRR, a public outreach firm, and she's running the uh, PowerPoint presentation so that I don't have to get confused with IT stuff. I can focus instead on you all and your questions and providing you with the best information we can. I was last presenting to this group in 2019, so I'll give an overview of the project for anybody who is new or needs a reminder, and uh, then provide a summary of what's changed since 
I last met with you before diving into the details of project updates and letting you know about some current and upcoming opportunities we have for you to provide input in the project. <clears throat> So for those who aren't aware, this project is really about regional and global commerce for Pierce County and the larger area. Three decades ago, our leaders identified a need for a primary north-south arterial connection between the Port of Tacoma and Fredrickson, the county's two most important manufacturing and industrial centers. At the time, and even still today, there really aren't any good north-south connections between those two points. You either have to go to the west and try the I-5 corridor or go to the east up Meridian. And we all know that both of those corridors can be awfully messy, particularly during rush hour. So the vision of the Canyon Road Regional Connection Project has been to make this connection, encourage the development to occur in Fredrickson and thereby bring in some more family wage jobs into Pierce County, creating a more efficient uh, connection for freight and commuters both. And this project is also coincidentally a leveraging Washtot's planned State Route 167 connection um, north of the Puyallup River, which is uh, something that was not foreseen 30 years ago, but has turned out to work very much in our favor. The project extends Canyon Road from its current terminus at Pioneer Way across the valley merges in with the current 52nd Street East, and then swings north to cross over the Puyallup River on a new bridge and join in with 70th Avenue East in the city of Fife. This final connection is the missing link for the entire Canyon Road corridor and over $100 million of improvements that Pierce County has made to that corridor in the last 30 years. So it's a very large project, so for the purposes of um, design and discussion mm -hmm. with the public, we've divided it into two projects, the river crossing portion and the railroad crossing portion. However, the entire project will look very similar to other parts of Canyon Road with four lanes, uh, two in each direction. There will be additional turn lanes where appropriate. There are a lot of pedestrian amenities like sidewalks and uh, lighting, illumination. This project has actually three structures. There is a grade crossing over the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad. There will also be two bridges, one over Clarks Creek, just east of 66th Avenue East. And then most significantly, a large new bridge over the Puyallup River replacing the Milroy Bridge, which will be removed as part of this project. There will also be some traffic signals added and um, due to the proximity to the rivers and the creeks and the wetlands in the area, there will be significant environmental work, stream relocation and mitigation as part of this project. So what has changed since I met with you in 2019? The last time we talked, we were partway through our design of the road crossing portion. Um, that is now 90% complete and the environmental permitting is pretty much complete. That project is well on its way to uh, being able to be constructed realistically uh, next year if we had the money. We've made a lot of progress on stream location and wetland restoration design. We've worked through most of the purchasing of the property that we need to build the railroad crossing portion of the project. For the river crossing portion, we've moved from preliminary design to 30% complete, and we're putting our property acquisition plan together uh, while we're conducting our environmental assessment. And of course, we are continuing with engagement with our stakeholders and community groups like you through briefings and online open houses, which we'll talk about a little bit further. The project schedule is very much on course from what I presented to you last time. Again, two portions of the project, the railroad crossing and the river crossing. The railroad crossing is virtually complete and ready to be built will actually be put on the shelf at the end of this year. The river crossing portion is in the design process. We're starting property acquisitions. We hope to have the environmental process, which we call NEPA and SEPA, complete in early 2023. And then both projects will be merged back together into one large contract that will go out to construction in 2025. 
and we anticipate that the project will take three years to complete. Of course, pending funding. Funding is always the big question on this project. We are far enough along with both portions that we have a fairly good idea now what the cost of construction will be. This will be a $250 to $300 million construction contract. It will be the single largest transportation project in Cruz County's history. The design and right-of-way acquisition is fully funded. Uh, we've been able to acquire a few grants to help us out with design and acquisition of property. And we have some secured funding partners, but a, a significant portion of the construction cost is uh, still unknown. And we're in the process of applying for numerous grants. We are working with our legislators for appropriations and earmarking of funds at both the state and the federal level. And Pierce County does have the ability to bond if necessary to fill in any gaps in project funding. So some basic updates. Uh, as I mentioned for the railroad crossing portion, which is shown here in blue, but also has a nice green circle around it. We have completed 90% plans and we'll be putting this design of this project on the shelf, waiting for the rest of the project to be completed. Something new though, we are adding a signal at the Chief Leshy entrance to Canyon Road. So that's a new addition to the project. And we are almost complete in acquiring all the property needed to construct this project. For those of you who don't remember or did not get to see this before, this is a view of what the crossing over the railroad tracks will look like if you're standing at the entrance to Chief Leshy School and looking southeast across the valley. The railroad tracks in this photo are over on the far right hand side. As you can see, the structure is quite a bit larger than necessary to just go over the railroad, railroad tracks. Um, this was done to address concerns about a visual barrier across the valley and also about farmers needs to be able to get from one side of Canyon Road to the other with this large structure in the middle. So farm equipment can cross underneath the structure and you can easily see across the valley. For the river crossing portion, we have made significant progress mm -hmm. since I met with you before. Our design is 30% complete. We're starting the conversations with property owners about property acquisitions necessary. And we are working through NEPA and SEPA, our environmental permitting process, and Brian will be giving you an update on that in a moment. In our previous outreach, we heard concerns about commuter traffic using local streets. We were also looking at alternate routes that may be necessary. So to help everybody understand how the new bridge will work, um, we've created this graphic. This is a rendering again. This isn't a real photograph because we haven't built it yet. Um, but this is, shows you the new bridge and how it's going to cross over Levy Road and River Road. So traffic on those two roadways will be flowing uninterrupted underneath the new bridge and the new roadway. Uh, so if you are traveling north or south on Canyon Road, there will be no direct intersection with Levy Road and River Road. And people always ask, well, how am I supposed to get to River Road and North Levy Road from Canyon Road then? So people crossing the bridge, will have the opportunity to access very easily. We have incorporated into our design. If you are crossing the bridge from Fife and want to get onto River Road, you will turn right on 66th Avenue and that will intersect directly with River Road. There'll be a new signal there and you can go left or right as necessary. If you are in Pierce County on Canyon Road and want to get on to North Levy, you'll cross the bridge headed north, take a right on 45th Street Port East, another right on 74th Avenue East, which will be a brand new roadway we're building in the city of Fife, and that will intersect with North Levy Road East. So similar to ramps on and off a freeway, although these are not ramps, um, you will be able to access the roads that flow underneath Canyon Road and the bridge. The bridge crossing will also include a shared use pathway that will be suspended underneath the structure. 
We've done this for a couple of reasons or a couple of advantages. One is it separates bicyclists, pedestrians, non-motorized users from the vehicle traffic. So that's a much safer situation, a lot less potential conflicts, but also it's allowed us to uh, decrease the size of the bridge. It no longer has to be so wide to accommodate um, sidewalks and uh, space for bicyclists. The bridge is narrower to just accommodate vehicles and the pedestrians will be underneath on a suspended shared use path. We'll also have signalized pedestrian crossings at both North Levy Road and River Road, uh, which will allow everybody to easily cross both of those roadways if they're using the Canyon Road corridor. The um, the bridge is also designed to take advantage of a connection with the Riverwalk Trail. Whenever it gets fully developed and built through this area, it will actually intersect um, with the planned Riverwalk Trail, either on the north or the south side of the Puyallup River very easily. As part of our design work, uh, we were required to do a significant environmental permitting. So I've asked Brian Johnston, our environmental supervisor on this project to join us and walk you through where we are in the environmental permitting process. Hello everyone. Um, I have a few slides here to talk about some of the environmental disciplines as we call them um, that we've studied. And uh, if you have questions as I go through these, feel free to stop me, um, just chime in, and uh, I can try and elaborate on, on what we're looking at here. Um, but so um, those, those disciplines that were on the previous screen, <laughs> thanks Jenny, um, they're, they're basically uh, required areas of the environment that are required to be studied under the National Environmental Policy Act, which um, is sim very similar to our State Environmental Policy Act. And, uh, and we call that NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act. And it's, at a, it's a federal umbrella uh, regulatory um, act. And so the, all these, there's, there's the Air Quality Act, Clean Water Act, um, Endangered Species Act. These are all federal acts that are underneath this greater NEPA umbrella. So as part of NEPA, we evaluate all these things. So um, for the river crossing of this project, uh, we're going through um, a level of NEPA analysis called environmental assessment. and. Um, these are various disciplines that we're studying in that environmental assessment. And ultimately, all these disciplines or reports will be an appendix to a greater environmental assessment report um, that will be prepared. Um, a lot of next year will be dedicated towards preparing that report. And it'll be a draft report, and there will be a um, public comment on that draft report and all these appendices. Um, but since that's a, about a year out, we thought it'd be a good time to touch base with the community. Here's our reports that are being developed. Some are in draft, some are fi you know, final as in ready for the EA and public review, a formal public review. But we thought it'd be good to do kind of an informal outreach to the community to say, here's what we've been doing. We haven't just been sitting on our hands. We actually have been studying a lot of these things. And so here's where we're at. Okay, thanks, Jenny. So on the, on the top of the list was air quality. And uh, as Leticia mentioned earlier, the important part of this project is connect connecting manufacturing uh, to the Port of Tacoma. So you imagine, yes, that's going to bring more traffic and particularly more diesel traffic. And so that, as our report um, indicated that we would expect, yes, air quality in the local area, in the local study area, is going to decrease because we will be bringing more truck traffic to that area. But um, regionally, it's air quality will have a benefit for the lower Puget Sound region uh, because of um, improved um, traffic connection, less congestion, 
um, and so on and so forth. And, and also, the, you know, the air quality report will make recommendations to have timed signals and minimize the amount of idling and things going on. And so those are things that can be addressed by the project. All right, next slide. Um, section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act uh, requires that we study, um, look for cultural resources and historic resources. Um, this particular area, um, pre, um, pre some of the Lahars, uh, was actually kind of at a confluence and maybe at the eddy of the Puget Sound um, many, 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 many years ago. And, uh, there's potential that there uh, could be a tribal village in this particular area. Um, and it's, you know, 25 feet down covered under some lahar debris, but there is a potential that there's um, cultural resources in the area is what our report found. And so um, when we do some excavating for the project, um, in particular for the big columns to support the bridge, we'll have an archeologist on site to look for any artifacts that might be discovered. Uh, the historic side of things, um, there's a, a historic house we call House of Tomorrow um, um, that was uh, done, uh, the architect designed this house, um, um, a famous architect from Tacoma, um, and the house is, it's kind of unique, it's a, kind of a house made of plywood, and it's really, really kind of unique kind of house, so that was found identified in the in the project area and uh, fortunately we're avoiding avoiding impacting the house okay Jenny drainage um, stormwater runoff um, stormwater requirements there's there's many laws and requirements for stormwater um, so our stormwater report identified what we're doing for stormwater and connecting it and retreating it um, before it goes back in the water. Uh, one of the things that was found out in, in consultation with Puyallup tribes is the, um, um, the, the limited capacity of the Puyallup River to handle any more pollutants. So one of the um, requests from Puyallup's and, and Department of Ecology was not to have any new outfalls to the Puyallup River. So the project is, um, done some extensive drainage design work. So the stormwater that's being captured will not go into the Puyallup River. It'll be going into other drainages that eventually make their way to the Puyallup River, but there will be no direct discharges. So our kind of our report captured that. Fish and wildlife. Um, one of the, the main things that this report will be studying is uh, endangered species. Bull trout's one, steelhead's one, chinook is another. Um, and so, as you can imagine, the new river will be, the new bridge will be going over the Puyallup River that has all these species in it. So what can we do to minimize the impact to those species? Um, so timing restrictions will be one of them. Um, the other big thing is it would be a lot cheaper to build a bridge that had um, that had piles in the river themselves. Um, it make a lot cheaper bridge, uh, but the impact to listed species for putting piles in the river or what we call below the ordinary high water mark would have an impact of fish, and so um, and. Uh, um, would be difficult to get through the Endangered Species Act um, if, if it could be avoided. So the project has been to, gone through some extensive design to be able to span the entire Puyallup River, um, which is great for fish. Um, although there will be some shading from the new bridge, um, there will be some uh, riparian buffer impacts from the new bridge. And, uh, we'll be mitigating that uh, by doing some other um, riparian restoration areas in what's now uh, a landscape facility. All right, next slide. Hazardous materials. Um, one of the things we do is um, a baseline assessment of property risks that might have contaminated um, and hazardous materials on those properties that might be within our project corridor and those those dots are all um, risks uh, that were identified in the report. Uh, the red dot is, a, is an existing landscape facility that some 
um, the people that did the assessment on ice found some risks. So eventually when we get on that property, the report recommended that we do some soil testing. So when we get on that property at some point, we'll do some soil testing to see if it is as risky as it is, or maybe it's not risky at all and it's clean. So that's what that report is about. Noise uh, with all the, um, the additional traffic that's gonna be coming on and making this new connection, we're bringing more vehicles um, to an area. And so that will um, increase noise and also the a widening of a road, you're bringing uh, vehicles that make noise um, closer to noise receptors, which are homes um, and also mobile home park. Um, on the right on the Fife side and on the Puyallup side. So uh, the report evaluates um, what are the noise levels predicted to be increased and um, if uh, noise walls could be a possible viable solution. So there was one spot um, that the noise report identified that a noise wall would be a benefit to the community. So, uh, but it's the community that gets the ultimate say on whether they want a noise wall or not. Maybe they don't want one for visual reasons or what have you. So um, we're gonna take the recommendation of our noise wall. We're gonna reach out to that community, um, which is the, the Gale Mobile Home Park and ask them if, if a noise wall is something they'd be interested in. If so we'll add it to the project. 4F properties, 4F is, um, uh, comes out of the National Transportation Act and it protects properties like parks um, that have been, that have received federal funding or are important value to the communities. Um, it, is, it protects several other things, but um, for this example, uh, the, the Milroy Bridge, because it's um, a historic resource uh, because of the architect, um, architectural design of the bridge, it's protected also uh, under this 4F. And uh, also there's a park in the city of Fife that uh, the, the project is going um, basically through a corner of. And so that, that property is also protected under 4F. And so uh, the pro as part of that report um, and the findings of that report, the, the county will be working um, one with the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation about Milroy Bridge and um, what can be done to, if the Milroy Bridge is going to be removed, uh, what can be done to recognize the importance of that bridge. And so um, how that comes out will be kind of out of this 4F. Um, and the other thing that we're working with is the city of Fife and the Parks Department about um, relocating some community gardens that might be impacted um, by the project and that's will be covered in um, under under this 4F analysis. Traffic, um, so that's the kind of the main purpose of this these projects is to improve traffic flow regionally, but there will be there will be some improved traffic locally and there will be um, some changes traffic local to traffic locally. So um, the report identified, um, where tra the traffic amounts going through the various intersections um, and identified um, best places for new intersections. Um, and early on, the traffic study is kind of what um, prompted the design team to come up with a what we call a grade separated project, which is um, having the, the bridge go over North Levy and over River Road rather than connecting with them at grade. Uh, the traffic, one of the traffic reports found that the uh, traffic flows a lot better by having a grade separated project that would go over those two roads. Not to mention the project's a lot cheaper to do a, a grade separated project. Uh, visual and aesthetics, that's also um, something to be studied uh, per the National Transportation Act. And so uh, we did a visual impact analysis and uh, one of the, what we hear from the agricultural community is, is how is this new road going to visually impact the rural character of this community? So um, what, uh, what we did is we kind of took some snapshot of what you see there's the Pika farm. 
and we try to do a visual rendering of what the project will look like uh, with, you know, with the Pika farm in the background still. So um, try to communicate what visually the project will look like. Uh, social and environmental justice. Um, this is a uh, several laws associated with this, but um, it's it's to uh, make sure that the project is being designed in a way that doesn't disproportionately impact uh, people of low income or minorities. Um, and so uh, it's it it comes back from back in the uh, the '60s when the Federal Highway Transportation used to um, used to route the highways through areas that were low income as a way for to deal with cheaper property. So that's where this act come from. So you're to make to ensure that that's not happening on federally funded projects. And so we're doing a, a social and environmental justice analysis to identify uh, the community characteristic in that area and show where uh, the, pro the impacts are for the project and to show that um, they're not disproportional impacts. So um, because uh, um, like I said, I just took the opportunity to check in with you all about where we are with our reports. Um, we have a um, website um, that's up to date and we're doing community outreach right now. Um, and then we have an online open house that you all can access. And several of these reports you can actually click on and look at and preview um, if you'd like. And then um, we have, uh, there's the online open house. Um, and then uh, basically be presenting exactly what I just presented to you about many of our reports um, during a, um, what are we calling it, Jenny? Sorry, my brain's blinking. The virtual town. Virtual town. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be reaching out to a broader community to kind of explain where we are um, with the environmental reports. So we have done a lot of public outreach over the last few years, even with COVID restricting in-person presentations while we were in this virtual environment presenting to other groups like yours. But we have successfully um, done some open houses, some virtual town halls. We've uh, had some workshops with the agricultural community, which I will um, get into a little more details about later. We've started a project blog and social media. We've continued to brief our partners in different jurisdictions and speak to legislators. So there's a lot that we've been able to accomplish even though we're not able to meet face to face. But as Brian said, the big news of the moment is our online open house. Um, Jenny will switch screens um, and show you a live version of our online open house. We invite you all to uh, log on and take your time going through it. Brian ran through very quickly uh, some of the information that's there, but you have the opportunity to get into some more of the details and even read some of the discipline reports that we have completed. Um, so it gets into a lot more of the, the nitty gritty of environmental permitting. Uh, we'll also be hosting a virtual town hall that is tied in directly with this online open house for the environmental review process. And we did send a postcard telling people about the online open house and the virtual town hall that went out to more than 1800 addresses in the project area, uh, used a press release and also some social media posts. So um, feel free to spread the word. We'd love to get more people um, involved in the project and get more people interested. And one of the ways to do that is to log on to our online open house or attend a virtual town hall. I'll, I'll put that link in the chat, but I can't tell if, I don't think I'm sharing. Am I, am I not sharing? Yes, you are sharing. Oh, okay. We are still on the online open house though. Can you switch back to the other? Okay, I will switch. Okay, is that uh, everything, Leticia? No, she needs oh, to okay. switch back to... here. Here okay. we go. Okay. 
All right, you're sharing again, Jenny, if you can move forward to the next slide. Okay. Great. We now have a project blog. We also invite you to uh, take a look at that. This is a way to stay connected with some of the more interesting aspects of the project that are not engineering focused. Um, the blog is accessible through our Stay Connected page on the Canyon Road Connection website. And I think Jenny is also going to put in the chat the link that will get you directly to the blog. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned previously, we've been doing a lot of work with the agricultural community. Uh, we went into a lot of workshops talking with them about um, what this project means to them, how it will impact them. And that led to the agricultural advisory com community requesting a resolution that was approved by council just a couple months ago. Um, per that resolution, we'll be looking at four different elements related to the project, signage in the area, speed limits in the area, looking at some design alternatives that could benefit the farming community, and how traffic imp impact fees are applied to agricultural areas such as this. The final report out on the ag resolution will be in March of 2022. So that is it for the presentation. Um, we are continuing with our design and environmental work. We're beginning the property acquisitions on the river crossing portion of the project, continuing our outreach to stakeholders in the communities. And of course, the all important funding opportunities for $300 million to construct. Brian and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. And thank you again for having us tonight. Thank you. Um, what I would suggest is if you have a question down at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions button. If you click on that, you should be able to see a raised hand and you just put your uh, click on that to raise your hand. And if I see everybody, then I can at least call on you. Um, see view. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Standard. There we go. Okay. Dan. This is a little too high tech for me. Uh, I have a comment. Okay. Uh, first of all, very supportive of your presentation and the project. It's been a long time coming. Um, I think it'll benefit the Stoma Waller community, taking some of the traffic off of Waller, Vickery, and Woodland, I presume. Secondly, it'll help move traffic from Fredrickson to the Port of Tacoma, which has a regional benefit. My concern and I hope that you will write this down and spread it to your peers and to the planning side of Pierce County, that in order to prevent this from becoming a $300 million, forgive the word, boondoggle, that you do not let Canyon Road become another meridian. Because if Canyon Road is allowed to go through any kind of a planning zone changes over the years to come, it will slow traffic down to the point where the benefit of having Canyon Road being a transportation corridor will greatly diminish. It will cause a lot of the trucks that are in our community to slow down, to stay, to emit diesel fumes, which will certainly not mitigate the environmental impact that you're trying to present here. So I would hope that rather than just passing this off as a comment, that this should be the cornerstone of your entire project that you're spending $300 million of taxpayer money for a worthwhile project. And unless it's kept as a thoroughfare from Fredrickson to the Port of Tacoma, it's like throwing money away. It's the definition of boondoggle if you let it get clogged up. So you're doing a fine job in building this wonderful resource, this transportation corridor, but unless somebody watches the back door and prevents it from becoming meridianized, if you will, you're, you're just gonna be it's gonna be the biggest embarrassment that you've ever seen. So I would like to make sure that you know what the left hand and the right hand are both doing, planning and public works come together. And if you're gonna spend this money, make sure that the transportation corridor remains an open corridor and not clogged up with every kind of commercial development, people turning right and left where these big diesel trucks can't get through. And that's my comment, thank you. Thank you. Those are excellent points and definitely something we're keeping an eye on um, as we move forward. Of course, uh, 
leaders change, leadership changes, decisions change. So I hope that you will join me in being the watchdog and be sure to speak up and say something if it looks to you like we are starting to meridianize, as you put it, the Canyon Road Corps. Because it's certainly not the intent of this leadership and this legislative body that we're working under today. The idea is to keep a very nice thoroughfare all the way through that really moves traffic efficiently from point A to point B. Yeah, my point is, if I could, if your document that you're producing, either the environmental assessment, the, 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 the plan, whatever it is that you're producing, should be premised upon the fact that it is kept open as a corridor. That should be the cornerstone of the entire project. Mm -hmm. Forget about the the future legislative authorities in Pierce County, as long as they refer back to a document that says that this corridor needs to be a corridor for transportation. If mm -hmm. you do that, then the future legislative authorities won't lose track of that because you can't count on everybody to come out there and, and, and try to keep it open. The document itself needs to speak to this. So I think the onus is on you folks to make sure that has happened and not to be relying on future people in front of a microphone trying to convince their county not to clog up Canyon Road. So I would greatly encourage you folks not to do this unless you make sure it's kept open as a corridor. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Angela. Jenny, you can probably stop sharing the slideshow now. I was just gonna ask if Jenny could go back one slide to the agricultural, because oh, okay. that was my, my Never question. Mind. <laughs> but, but regardless, maybe you can just answer my question. So one of the initial, um, kind of topics that came to our attention really was agricultural focused. And that's why I think we had you uh, come to our meeting in 2019 is kind of, that's what sparked the conversation. Uh, could you maybe identify uh, with those conversations that you've had with the Agricultural Advisory Committee, are there any specific uh, project elements or features that that you have identified with that group that you'll be incorporating into the project that we would be able to see as we're driving through? The resolution is actually a direct result of the solutions that the agricultural community came up with. Mm -hmm. um, we really wanted them to identify the solutions that they saw as having value to them. Mm -hmm. And those solutions included wanting agricultural signage in the area, similar mm -hmm. to the photo that you see here. Mm -hmm. um, wanting to have some uh, lower speed limits considered through the agricultural production area, even particular to specific times of the year when they're having uh, the festivals, the corn maze and pumpkin patch in October, things like that. Um, they wanted to look at traffic impact fees being reduced or perhaps even waived completely for development of uh, farming production elements, um, such as uh, a fruit stand or creating a parking lot for these festivals, development that is still farming related. And they wanted to look at some design alternatives, such as um, instead of sidewalks on both sides of the roadway, what if you eliminated the sidewalks on one side? Um, could we have, this is what they're saying, could we have some crossings at specific locations that work good for our farm equipment and our customers when they come to our um, events and to purchase some of our produce? So those are some of the design elements that we're going to be looking at and reporting out on to the council. The, um, the idea is that a lot of the concerns the agricultural community brought forward through these workshops, in the end, weren't really specific to this project. They were actually larger concerns that would be applicable to any project in the county. And that's why we really encourage the Agricultural Advisory Commission to get involved and to request the council look at some ideas that could be applied at other agricultural areas when other capital improvement projects, other roadway projects come through. So the idea is that we're going to look at these elements for the Canyon Road project and we may apply a lot of them to this project, but that they will be applied in the future to other projects as well through other agricultural communities. So at this point in time, what I know for sure is that there is going to be additional agricultural signage that's already in the works. 
the traffic group of the Planning and Public Works Department is looking at the speed limits and the traffic impact fees. I don't know what the results of that are. This resolution was just passed at the end of July, uh, early August, so this is uh, brand new. And we are going to be looking at some of these um, roadway design elements over the next few months to report out in March. So those are still unknowns as to what will be applied to the project at this time. Hey, Larry. Thank you. Yeah, again, I'd like to thank uh, Leticia and Brian for uh, attending our meeting this evening. Um, for those people who might uh, uh, be viewing our recording later on, and that live in the Summit Waller area, uh, they can rapidly see that, uh, or obviously see that uh, a widening of Canyon Road through our community is uh, progressing. And maybe uh, Leticia, you could give us a quick uh, summary as to when uh, the segment between 84th Street and 72nd, and then 72nd down to Pioneer, and, and then 99th South to uh, uh, 512, when those would be complete through our community. Absolutely. The segment from 84th to 72nd will be advertising for a construction contract in the next month or two. Uh, so construction on that uh, segment will start probably early spring, although there might be some work over the winter, but that one is, is going to be going to construction in just a few months. Um, the segment from 84th to 99th is wrapping up. You see brand new sidewalks through there, brand new pavement. From 72nd down the hill toward Pioneer, we are in the early stages of the design looking at uh, the environmental impacts of the roadway widening that's necessary on that hill portion. So I don't have a time frame for that particular project until we know more about what will be necessary to actually build the um, developed roadway section, the widened roadway section. And the segment from 99th to 512 is also very early in the stages of design, as in, I think we just are getting survey together. So much too soon to tell, probably at best a few years away in um, doing those particular improvements in that area. But all the pieces, I mean, we are moving forward with all of them. The, the big push is to try and get everything completed um, for this project to be constructed and the corridor to be complete at that point in time. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I have a few questions here. I'm actually gonna start uh, with Brian now. I'm not sure if I heard correctly. The house tomorrow, which is right there at where you're going to have the uh, new intersection getting on to um, River Road, the project is or is not impacting that house. So, uh, from what we will be doing a driveway reconstruction um, so their driveway can connect with the new road. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not impacting the house. The property, um, there is a portion of the property um, that we, looks like we might need to put in a stormwater outfall into the creek. Um, so we might need some part of that property, but not the house. Now I say that, and then so, but there's also a bigger Pierce County, and I know that surface water management has been working with FEMA to try and get that house out of the floodplain, because that's it's basically in the floodplain right now. And they were working with the property owner to, because they need to be a willing seller um, mm -hmm. to either relocate the house if possible, if it's not feasible, then maybe demo, but I, I don't know where surface water is on that. So I, I said, when we're making all this work to avoid the, the house, and I don't want you to see it. Well, the house just is go, just got demo. What the heck's going on? So that that'd be that'd be a surface water FEMA grant project. So okay. yeah, because I know it's it's a historic house, but it doesn't have any historic designations to it. So there's really nothing to protect it. So that's a status, unfortunately. Um 
Now, the the signs is, that were part of, well, the sign it was an example for the um, resolution regarding agricultural areas. People drive as fast as they think it's safe to drive regardless of the speed limit, unless there's enforcement on a regular basis in a place. Is, and this is gonna be by the picture, four lane plus a center turn light. What would you be doing to do a, is there a traffic calming mitigation that you can take in that area between Storinos and Picas? That is one of the aspects that um, is being looked at as part of the signage and the speed limit uh, study is um, what can be done, particularly during, um, all I can think of right ahead is the pumpkin patch, the October uh, particular, but I'm, I'm, there are a number of other events that they have throughout the year. Um, is there a are there particular elements of traffic control and traffic calming that can be implemented during those peak um, public attendance times for the farmers in that area? Um, don't take the sign photo that was up there literally. That is an example photo from somewhere north. It's not necessarily what we installed as part of this project. We're working with the agricultural community to come up with what that needs to look like and what it needs to say. It was an example, mm -hmm. but they will be looking at other elements that may be necessary during those um, peak times where the, the public is out in droves to celebrate certain times of the year and take advantage of our farming communities. Okay, because even say in uh, July, late June, early July, when you've got uh, berry sales going on down mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of in and out traffic. Yes. So, yes. I mean, it's not just you know, certain weekends. Mm -hmm. um, Correct. Let's see. The, oh, there's going to be a water facility that's going to be going in near 72nd, just south of where the coffee shop is. The county storm water, stormwater pond, yes. Right. Um, I would imagine you're going to be pulling out a lot of trees. Are you going to be doing anything on the back side of that to mitigate for those people who live on the opposite side of the creek and are going to be impacted by this? Or the people who live immediately to the south of it? Brian, would you like to try to answer this one? We are, we are planting trees, uh, but not to mitigate for sight um, or visual impacts. It's uh, because of proximity to the creek that's back there, it's a, a right, protected riparian area. And so there will be uh, buffer impacts. So we'll be planting what we can. We'll be planting trees mm -hmm. um, as part of a riparian buffer enhancement for the project. Mm -hmm. Because there will, there will, well, the trees wouldn't help much, but there will be a significant increase in the amount of noise that's going to happen at that uh, intersection once this goes through. Um, let's see. And I think you answered my other questions when you were speaking with other people. Um, any final thing you want to add? Chris has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. Yeah, so um, in the air quality uh, kind of study and report, is that looking at kind of the current development in Fredrickson and that routing of traffic from like 512 up Canyon? Or is that also factoring in the future development of tilt ups and like the you know, huge increase of industrial activities that are going to be out there and the the increase of traffic volume that that's going to bring, or just like I said, looking at the, the current rerouting of traffic. So um, it, it models future conditions and I can't, I wanna say 2040 or maybe it's 2030 future built out conditions that go into a traffic model uh, to predict what the future traffic flows will be and uh, um, it's a tremendous amount of planned zoning development that goes into supporting that traffic model. And then that's what the air quality analysis is based on. If you, the, the air quality report is one of those reports that you can access off of the website. So you can 
read it. That one is that one is done. That might I would assume that uh, to answer Chris's question, we could look in the cumulative effects section as well because you're looking at not just your project but your project combined with past, present, and future projects and the cumulative effects. So um, would that be something that you're covering in your NEPA document? It's not for air quality. It's not called cumulative effects. It's but it it takes into account that the whole corridor is built all the way to to Fredrickson and and makes that connection to the port. So it makes the makes that assumption. Is there an assumption that housing for the new jobs that will be out there was, will be primarily in the Fredrickson area, or are you looking at a significant increase in commuter traffic coming from the Tacoma area? and using Canyon Road as a way to get out there? Um, I recall what the traffic reports were saying in the air, but it, I, I recall was saying quite a, quite a lot of local commuters will be using it to get I-5 North. Although originally planned as a freight corridor, in the 30 years since it was designated, of course, uh, the attitude of the world in general has changed dramatically and now recognizes that transportation improvements can't really be focused exclusively on just one user because acknowledging commuters are going to use it, people taking their kids to schools, people going to grocery stores, they're going to be more than just large trucks using any major transportation corridor that we build. So um, although we continue to call it a freight corridor and that is its original purpose, the project scope has had to evolve over time to accommodate all of the additional commuter traffic and other users, pedestrians, bicyclists that uh, we think we'll be utilizing the corridor. So all of that has been incorporated into our discipline report analysis, our traffic analysis, all those um, elements that are part of the NEPA and SEPA process. And since you mentioned bicycles, and I am a bicyclist, and I have used Canyon, mm -hmm. I'm really concerned because it's becoming, it will become like Canyon Road south of 512, which is an absolutely unsafe place for bicycles in spite of the bicycle lane markings that are painted on the side. Those bicycle gutters are one of the most dangerous places for a cyclist to be, and there's studies that back that up. Um, so I would certainly hope that the county wouldn't be pretending that this is gonna be a place for bicycles and in any documents try to route bicycle traffic maybe over to Waller Road, which is a much slower and lighter traffic road. Our design is intended to be an all users design. So as a bicyclist, you can certainly use the Canyon Road if you so choose, um, just like people can choose to walk along the improvements that are there. Um, the shared use suspended path below the bridge is designed to accommodate bicycles as well as pedestrians. Um, but everybody has to make their own choices. And I happen to agree with you. I think Wall Road would be where I would choose to bicycle instead just because it's a quieter roadway. Um, but we do try to incorporate all active transportation elements in our designs. So um, this, this is very much a corridor that bicyclists could and should use if they so choose. Patricia, is that a federal highway requirement or is that a county road requirement since it's a county road? It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is a county road, but it's also a, um, a highway through FHWA. They recognize it as an arterial um, roadway with certain standards that are necessary. But the county has also um, adopted complete streets ordinances, have adopted active transportation elements, bicycle plans, things like that. So we do have to take all of those elements into account when we're designing a roadway improvement like this. Yeah, and understood and it's hard for us uh, rural separator residents to really appreciate that because 
we like the rural separator. We mm -hmm. like the fact that there aren't sidewalks and illumination on every single block. I mean, that's just why we, a lot of reason why a lot of us live here. So, but understand that's also a requirement that you or the county uh, needs to meet uh, if they want federal funding. Absolutely. <laughs> so. If we don't do it, we suddenly don't become eligible for all that money. <laughs> Again, anything else you'd like to add, or are we good? I think Dan was trying to raise his hand, oh, but he's uh, oh, plotting he's, instead. Yeah, real quick question. This Canyon Road north of the river, it ties into five, or excuse me, uh, I-5, doesn't it? Canyon Road north of the river becomes 70th Street East in the city of Five, and they are incorporating access points to SR 167 north of our project. Um, and I would encourage anyone who is interested in that to go to DOT's website. It is their project that is incorporating uh, additional access points to SR-167 and I-5 within the city of Fife. Department of Fife Transportation? Or what? I'm sorry, no, uh, Washington State Department of Transportation. Oh, okay, um, but if a person is driving north or south on I-5, can they easily take an, uh, an exit and, and access Canyon Road? They will be able to easily take an exit and access Canyon Road. It may not be 100% uh, direct. You may have to take an access. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, and nothing is coming to mind right offhand. You will not see on I-5 an exit for Canyon Road. Correct. You will see on I-5 an exit for 70th Avenue or 56th or, or other streets in the city of Fife that connect into Canyon Road. But Canyon Road technically will stop at the city of Fife city limits. Are they going to create a four, is, is Fife or the, uh, Washington State going to create a four lane highway through Fife? The uh, 70th Avenue has already been improved to accommodate are connecting Canyon Road into their roadway. They still have some improvements uh, like we do to finish um, in anticipation of this, but they've invested a lot of their own money into a roadway that will match Canyon Road and will be able to handle the traffic that will be funneling north onto 70th. Well, I guess my point is people, commuters, if I will, commuters will eventually figure it out. Mm -hmm. that Canyon Road is accessible from I-5. So to answer your Correct. question, it be much more than just a, a truck uh, freight route. Yes, it opinion. has to be. Yeah. So, so to be more specific for you, Dan, um, 70th Street terminates at nine, um, Pacific Highway 99 in Fife at a, at, a, at a recently improved area where it, it basically terminates into a traffic circle that makes you go north or south on 99th. Right. Well, so, be so that that's where it is, but there's no direct access from the freeway at this point unless they create that down the road but right now that's not what what, what the case is okay thank you okay. Okay. well thank, thank you, you very much and brian and jenny for coming and sharing with us tonight thank you thanks guys thank you nice meeting you all thank you all right next item orange gate park and Larry is reported 17 and a half hours for August in spite of, are you feeling better tonight, Larry? Uh, yeah. Good. Yes, I am. Feeling back to normal. Good. Okay. Um, did, did, did we want to, you expressed an interest to uh, keep La Letitia Neal around a little longer to talk about uh, 84th and Vickery? Maybe we uh, should deal with that. Next. Oh, we, we certainly could. I didn't realize she was here for that as well. Okay. okay. I, I'm not technically here for that. And um, <laughs> I hate to say this, but I actually need to get off the call. I have another commitment tonight I have to go and deal okay. with. So I will right. connect with Angela later about the traffic signal. I'm very interested to hear what you guys are talking about. All right. Thanks, Leticia. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Back to Orange Gate. Um, there is a final, you know, revised final updated proposal for what's going to happen with Orange Gate. It's on the update page. Um, it's about, a, I think a 36 page document if I remember correctly. 
there are still some small things like just exactly where trails are going to go in, um, a few other things, but the basic plan is there. Um, the Pierce County Community Development Committee is going to have a hearing on it coming up on September 20th at 1.30 p.m. Um, and I included the link to the master plan again in our uh, meet in the agenda. And I'll also add that during uh, August, I was out there for another three days working trails. There were some people who weren't real happy about it. And there were other people who really appreciate the work that we were putting in trying to improve the trails, um, making it so that they're a little wider, a little clearer. Um, you have fewer opportunities for conflicts between different types of users. Uh, the last thing we were doing was moving a trail. We built some new trail and shut off an old one that took people immediately along the back fence line of some property owners so that you don't have people wandering along those fence lines. Um, and then there's still quite a bit to do that we will probably, Washington Trails Association, I should say, will be working with the county on building new trail, improving trail in other sections of the park through the winter. Um, Larry, anything you have to add? Uh, yeah, just an update on things that have been going on. Recently had uh, Steve uh, Dippery, who is the uh, park specialist. Uh, he's, he's new at that job. Uh, been, uh, been there only a couple of, couple of months. Uh, had him, we've had him out twice. Uh, the second time uh, uh, was over issues uh, dealing with the uh, problems that we're having with uh, uh, people in the park. Um, just a rundown there. Uh, yes, I did spend about 17 and a half hours in August. Uh, most of the time that I go out, I'm out for at least uh, an hour and a half to two hours to two and a half hours. Um, there's quite a few people that park along uh, 84th Street and 46th Avenue. Uh, we've had recently um, uh, a Toyota pickup filled with garbage that was dumped there. That's been removed. Uh, there was a minivan uh, with no license plates. Uh, that was removed uh, within the last day or so. Currently, there is a fifth wheel uh, RV trailer. Uh, that's been reported at uh, the abandoned vehicle hotline. Uh, that hasn't been dealt with as of yet. Um, in the last couple of months, it appears that uh, Orange Gate Park, uh, on the uh, north side of 84th, there's a blue welcome to uh, Orange Gate Park sign with a entry point into uh, tr a trail system. Uh, leading into the North 40. Uh, there's about three dead end trails that offshoot from that trail system. And it, and it has, it's appear, appeared that from all the evidence that I've gathered, both physical and uh, surveillance wise, uh, we have a, a gay sex issue in Orange Gate Park. And uh, we're, uh, that that prompted um, me to get Steve Dippery out and show him exactly where these sites are. Pierce County Parks will will uh, check these sites at least once a week. Uh, I check them out, and uh, I mean I've I've pulled uh, chairs out of there, blankets, uh, pillows, uh, uh, male clothing. Uh, so we have uh, an issue with. Uh, single adult males going into the park there. Uh, so far, there hasn't been any major complaints about that, but uh, you know, these are things that I discover as I go around picking up garbage and monitor the trails. Um, other than that, uh, just uh, you know, the usual garbage that's left behind. Um, and uh, other than that, the park's pretty clean. Okay, thank you. Okay, next I'm on the agenda, the utility box wrap. So Angela, can you give us any kind of an update on where we are with that? 
I know that the uh, Arts Commission has opened up their uh, submission. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't call it a competition, but you can submit your artwork for utility box wraps between now and September 13th. It wasn't a very long uh, window, so I was kind of surprised. Um, so I don't know that I I'm, I'll be curious to see what they get for submissions. I know I found it to be really hard to drum up quote, local artists, especially for Summit Waller or even District 5. Um, I know there were a couple in Midland that were, were interested and were thinking about submitting, um, but I don't know that we were, I don't know how successful we will be to quote, stack the Arts Commission with uh, Summit Waller focused artwork. So I'm hoping that uh, Chelsea and uh, council member Campbell will, um, work with us and, and hopes that we can maybe have some later submissions or they, they could, I don't know, something. We just don't have anyone on our board that can do graphic artwork. And so it was kind of, it's kind of hard for us to rely on others in the community to do that. So I do know that the 13th is the, the deadline for that. Um, I did let Chelsea know that the board wanted the two option, we wanted both options, which was to go ahead and get two boxes wrapped this year with this budget. Uh, and we gave her a couple of uh, intersections for that. And then the rest will come in the next budget cycle. So she passed that information along. So we will, we'll wait and see what we, what we get, I guess. And, and um, Ooh, I'm, I'm here. I had to hop off for a second because there's someone at my front door. Yep. But um, amazing summary. I will pass along that feedback because we are meeting with Betty to figure out the best path forward. But I will pass along that feedback that that window is just like super tiny. Yeah. And um, we're working on doing the outreach efforts as well. But really appreciate y'all sharing all that information and your yep. thought partnership and collaboration. <laughs> you bet. Well, yeah, I'm hoping I'm hoping we can come up with something like, you know, we were thinking, oh, we'll work with the high school students. OK, well, they're not 18 and that's a requirement and they're not in school yet. And so we were, were kind of struggling with, does anyone know an artist that would be willing to design a utility box? And I mean, I know my neighbor and he was like, eh, he passed on that. So other than that, I don't know that anyone really like knew someone directly that A, could do it and B was willing mm -hmm. <laughs> and, could, and and three C could submit by the deadline. So. <laughs> I will um, I will flag the age limit as well because I love that idea of getting the youth involved and I wonder if there's a thing where we can just do like parental consent because that it just seems like that is such a great opportunity to yeah do you know work with kids and get them more involved yeah I'll, pa I'll pass that along and I'll um, I'll let you know if, if we're able to make some changes next year. All right, appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just Thanks, trying, to make our, trying to make our community a little, little nicer. <laughs> okay, now moving on to new business, the flashing light at 84th and Vickery. Yeah, so Chelsea, I hope you can stick around and at least listen to this uh, part of the conversation. Um, I was there was some conversations on our Facebook group a while back about uh, there was like a, I think there was a pretty gnarly accident, 84th and Vickery. And one of the uh, uh, people that had witnessed it or was concerned about it said, well, I want to know how we can get a, in, you know, a lighted intersection at 84th and Vickery. And of course I cringe when they say a lighted or signalized intersection, I'm like, Oh, not every intersection in Summit Waller needs to have a, stupid signal with lights and illumination and all this other stuff. But um, so the idea was, could there be some other sort of traffic measures uh, be put in place that would be more fitting with the community yet were uh, that might help reduce accidents at that location. But I'd have to look, we'd have to work with the Pierce County Roads to determine if that's a high accident location. Um, you know, what sorts of measures could be implemented, but it was a concern. Um, Tiffany was one of the um, residents was, she was going to attend tonight, but 
obviously is uh, not on the meeting, but um, she brought it forth and wanted to express her concern for that. And she wasn't the only one. There were a couple of others so like, yeah, so that can be kind of a bad intersection at night. So what can we do? Um, so I told us Summit Waller um, might be able to, you know, help write a letter or craft some sort of um, notification to the council. Could we also, I, I would wonder what the county rules are regarding property and sight lines. Because right. Because on yeah. the east side of that intersection, there isn't anything until you're right up into the intersection just about. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. if property owners had to clear out so that you had a sight line from farther back, maybe that mitigates a little bit of it. And like I say, we don't really know what the data is as far as yeah. the number of incidents there. But it's, yeah. that is the one intersection on Vickery that really scares me more than any other. Yeah, there were a couple people that said, yeah, I've, I've failed to stop there myself because they zone out and they don't see the stop sign until, you know, it's right there and then it's too late or they're coming westbound and you're coming down the hill and it's not obvious, that sort of thing. Um, well, one so thing anyway. I, something I saw when I was living in Battleground, there was a county road that had a very long stretch without a stop until you got to a stop sign at a state highway. They had a lot of accidents there. Finally, after a fatality, either the county or the state put in flash, a flashing sign or some yellow lights that would come on when traffic would approach and it would give you like maybe a quarter mile or an eighth of a mile of warning that, hey, you've got a stop sign up here just to make sure, you know, and maybe something like that could happen instead of a flashing intersection sign or, you know, I imagine there are people who think, oh, we can get a three-way sign or a stop, go and caution sign here or light. Yeah, re-engineering the road gets that weird drop in it. Mm -hmm. It's hard, it's a real awkward intersection to probably have anything like that. Uh, I'd like maybe before, you know, on 84th coming uh, towards Victory, they could do something like a double rumble strip where it gets your attention that hey something's changing a bit plus a, a sign even if it's not triggered by 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 something which is you know that obviously that's extra expense that they have to take but a simple red flash on a stop ahead with a with rumble strips or something like that that, that at least gets their attention before they get there because that if you're if you're going there at a pretty good clip which we all know people drive way faster on these roads and is posted um then yeah it can take it by surprise yeah they've got those little rumble strips on uh, sorry husband's watching zombies right now and it's really loud uh, sorry um <laughs> walking <right>. dead <laughs> um so on the 104th in bakery there's those what you know little turtles or the rumble strips that are now ever since they've re uh, resurfaced bakery they're missing and they haven't been replaced on the north side of, of 104th. So they're on the south side, but not the north side. So maybe even something as simple as that on both sides could be a suggestion. But I, I maybe Dan or Larry, can you, uh, thanks Chelsea. Uh, could you guys maybe chime in on what we've done on previous yeah, I can, I, can, I can give you several examples. Um, right now, uh, 84th and Vickery is not the most dangerous intersection. It's 96th and Vickery where there have been fatalities. Um, if you're going westbound on 96, uh, you hit Vickery real quick. The sight line is terrible. Um, Don Brunson has, uh, the neighborhood watch guy, has, has witnessed many, many accidents there. Um, the Summit Waller Community Association and uh, Neighborhood Watch tried to get uh, a four-way stop at uh, Vickery and uh, 96, uh, bigger stop signs, uh, cross traffic does not stop signs on Vickery. There used to be cross traffic does not stop uh, at the 104th and Vickery. Mm -hmm. uh, those have since been taken down. 
Uh, some private citizens may had their own cross traffic does not stop signs put up. Those were taken down by the uh, uh, road crews because they weren't official. They didn't have the official stickers on the back. Um, you know, I as far as a flashing light is concerned, personally, you're wasting your time as far as I'm concerned. Um, the rumble strips are probably about all you're going to be able to get. Um, unfortunately, uh, Public Works is going to say, no, we can't do that. That's not part of the uh, official national code. Uh, they won't, they won't do four way stops because they're the most restrictive uh, traffic control that there is. Um, especially on an arterial like 104th and, uh, and uh, 84th. Uh, so, you know, good luck with whatever you want, but I think you could probably get the rumble strips. Um, maybe if you insist, you could get cross traffic does not stop signs at 84th, 96th, and 104th, make a big effort to do that at least, uh, with the, along with the rumble strips mm -hmm. on, uh, on Victory. Um, that's, my, that's my opinion. Have we requested those before formally from the association? I don't think so. I think we were mainly working on larger stop signs and possibly uh, the uh, cross traffic does not st stop uh, signs on 96 and 104. And did we did we do that via writing a letter to the uh, en engineer and our council person, which probably would have been Talbert at the time? Yeah, I believe we did the letter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do I have a copy of it? Uh, I'm not sure whether I do or not. Okay. I'm just curious if that might be the course of action that we take again is just to ask the county to at least look into it. I mean, if, if nothing else, what are the traffic counts? What are the accident numbers? Would it trigger enough to install any of those measures is all the question we're really asking. Yeah, on the success side, the community association has uh, street lights at the, those three intersections, which they didn't have before. Yeah, that's part of the solution. And Jen, you had your hand raised. Oh, it was it was for a little while ago when when we brought up the topic about mm. being able to see. And I just I noticed uh, that last time I took a jog down that way, I was ten steps into the road before I realized I was on. I don't know which one, whether it was 84th or 96th, but I know that I missed the stop sign because I'm on the opposite side of the road and you get fixated on the long term or on the ground beneath your feet to make sure you're not misstepping. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't even see the sign or that it was a road until a you know, car was coming. <laughs> yeah. So I, it's a problem for pedestrians and I would imagine bicyclists as well. So. Anything else, Jen? I mean, not, excuse me, um, Angela? No, I just didn't know what the appetite would be for the uh, board to write a letter to the county and, and our council member. I didn't know what the appetite was for that. Unless, um, Chelsea, you think that you bringing it up to council member Campbell is adequate, or do you think a letter might help? I'll bring it up to him and see what he says about the best path forward. Usually what happens is we have to then like forward it to a few people to like get the actual answer. And I think yeah. there's more weight if it comes from you all. So I will yeah. check with him and then I'll just get back to you, Angela, on if it okay. would be helpful to have a, a formal letter. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Chelsea, you. Uh, yeah. Chelsea, is it? I'm thinking if the uh, Pierce County Council would actually initiate an ordinance requiring cross traffic does not stop signs on Vickery uh, at 84th, 96th, and 104th, then the uh, public works would be required to install those signs. I will 
pass all these ideas along. So I have 84th, 96th, and 104th on Vickery, mm -hmm. flashing lights, some kind of warning or stop sign ahead, even that the double rumble. Mm -hmm. um, and then need cross traffic does not stop terrible sight line and 96 in Vickery there was a fatality there oh yeah this so this is what I'm going to pass along to to council member Campbell and I'll ask if we can do an ordinance that requires cross traffic signage yeah there's been a shrine even at 96 in Vickery for quite a while I, I'm not sure if it's mm -hmm. still there but it was there for a very long time okay if not still Awesome. Thank, well, that's not awesome, but I mean, this, this working together is, is awesome. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you for sharing this. And I will, um, it's great to not only identify the issue, but to brainstorm some solutions. So I will make sure to get this along to him. And if it's helpful to have a letter from you all that we can forward, I will reach out to Angela. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you Chelsea. Okay, next item, the uh, website. And so I will pass that on to Gabe. You need to unmute yourself, Gabe. Hi, sorry. So there have been a few forwards uh, from multiple members of multiple board members about basically parroting Mar Marty Campbell's newsletter that's publicly posted online for everybody to see on the website. Um, I don't have a problem with doing that. I'm just wondering, is it more beneficial for us to actually try to be proponents for getting people to find their information on their own or just to continually parrot one particular person's newsletter that they are already making public that's available for other people to subscribe to on their own? And, and the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is we have our website, which at best we have, I think our best month is like 318 people came to look at the website and that's this unique visit. That could be the same person looking at it from two different computers or two different devices. That's the best. The Summit Waller community on Facebook has over 1600 people on it. It's a much larger footprint to be able to get the reach into, you know, for everybody to do it. So Marty Campbell will actually post or Chelsea does a forum. I'm not sure which one, which one actually is really doing it, but, um, but we'll post updates oftentimes from their regular newsletters. So are we, what is the focus we wanna put for the Summit Waller community? Sure, the important news of the month will capture a few people. Most of those people are probably also being captured on Facebook. And I know that I think five of you aren't even on the Facebook group. So you, don't, you have no clue what's being posted there. You have no idea what information is being presented. You don't even have your hand on the pulse of what's actually happening in the community because you aren't in those the Facebook group with us. And so I think that there's a huge demographic of people that we're missing out on. And website, I hate to say it, it sounds kind of silly. We're not really monetizing the website. We're not really making an active drive to get people to go there. But the Facebook group is where the traffic is. That's where the people are actually showing up and, and as a whole really communicating with each other. Um, you know, Angela and I are doing, you know, you know, pretty good job of making sure that it stays relevant. The bigger topics that are obviously going to affect more than just a small segment or just a, just a local, hyper-local uh, group are actually getting you know, light shine on it. So what I'm liking, what I'm looking for is what, you know, let's come up with a plan for the website. And sure, we did a facelift. It looks a bit better. It's easier to navigate now. But I would like to propose, unless somebody has a better idea, let's, let's use that as a resource where we can point people to for static information like history of the community, information about the community, the parks, the resources, local information like the list we have of the, you know, the, the different types of topics we have. People ask about roadside you know, debris or, or traffic problems or dumping or derelict vehicles and stuff like that. So we have all that there on the website and also about our, our board and then again, the local history. So, um, I think it's a good way for us to be able to link people to it, but it's really not a, a place that's driving viewership for community involvement. And so I, I, I think we're kind of getting lost in just saying, just throwing everything up on the website 
and we don't really have a plan for it. So I'm hoping we can come up with something more, more, more focused as far as what, what the point of the website is gonna be going forward. Mm -hmm. And then using the more flexible social media platform to actually be involved with the community. And so that, that's really what I'm coming down to. So it's not so much, here's what we have to do. I, I, I wanna know what we want it to do going forward. So we can actually have a better idea instead of just everybody throwing something out there and hoping, I mean, sure, I'll post it, you know, but is it necessary? Is it really that important to the whole community? Or is it just somebody's pet project? And because they're involved with it, they think it's important, but not everybody else is going, I, I don't care about this. You know, I think it's hard because there's, I mean, there are a lot of people in our community that are not on Facebook. And I think, my husband raises his hand. Yeah, yes, <laughs> he's one of them. Uh, and so where do they get their information? Well, they they look elsewhere and they you know, look at websites and that sort of thing. So I think it's, it's trying to find the balance between how much do you put and how much do you use both of those um, formats, those platforms. And yes, it's much easier for me to post something on Facebook than to email it to you and then have you post it on the, on the website and then people dig through it and that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know if I have a really good answer to your question, Gabe, but maybe what we could start doing instead of putting so much, um, what we could do on the Facebook group itself is yes, tell them all the things that are happening like, by the way, the Waller Road Adopt, Adopt Road Cleanup event needs to be updated on the website now that we have one. Yeah. Um, rather than us putting all the information in Facebook, we just say, here's the link to the website. Go find that information. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what I've been trying to do with people. Like, everyone always asks, what's the non-emergency phone number for the Sheriff's Department? What's the non emergency Oh, jeez. Yeah. I know. <laughs> it's, the constant, it's the constant mantra, that. And, and unfortunately, we don't have, like, South Hill, where people are complaining about somebody's, you know, car being parked in front of their house. I mean, I mean that that's you know we don't have to deal with that nonsense, but um, but yeah, we we do still have the more serious thing where hey, there's people looking like they're squatting on this property or inside this, you know, the structure or something like that. So that that's that's really important things we want to be able to do. But what do you do about it? So yeah, instead of us posting for them what to do is like oh we have that resource. I've been trying to do that more. Like oh we have that on our website and then send them a link to the website actually to the page yeah. that they can find the information on. Yeah, I've seen you do that. Thank you for doing that. I, 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 I try to try to give them the tool. I'm not, I'm not trying to give them a fish. I'm trying to give them a fishing rod. So mm -hmm. you know, let's, we have the resources. Please to, take a look at it. Not everybody's going to do it. Not everybody knows to do it. And the more we do it, the more often people, hopefully, I would love to see other board members also being the ones that say, oh, it's on our website. Um, I would like this. I'd like to see more of a chorus of the board speaking as, as a whole instead of just me and Angela. So, and, and yes, it's a little bit of a pet peeve and I hate Facebook. I really do hate Facebook. I, I only got back onto it for my business and, and then I'm like, okay, well, we do have a better contact on it. So I'll do it. You know, damn it. I'll do it. But I'm, you know, I, I hate it. I post fluff on there just to keep it, just to keep it active and involved. So, you know, you don't have to dive in, you know, and get your waiters on and wait into the deep end of the, the cesspool of Facebook. You can actually just go straight to one community and have it ping you with updates so you can see what's going on and maybe respond to it. I would love to see our president on the group being in contact with the community directly. That would be a really good plus. We haven't had that for the last two presidents. No offense to you guys, but we haven't had that. And it is a huge avenue for us to be in contact with the community. Uh -huh. And the second thing would be, um, and it's semi-related to it, we need to know who we have currently in our uh, membership role. We have no clue. We will, I would love to be able to cross-reference and take a look at our members list on the Facebook group and see who's a, currently a um, supporting membership person, or maybe they were a lapsed membership um, for SWC a supporting member. Uh, it'd be good to see who we're contacting. We might just be missing out on people just renewing because they haven't really paid much attention. We haven't done a whole lot of effort in that Regard, we can do it digitally mm -hmm. and then maybe attract some of the people that are moving in they're younger that are moving in new to the area and the only way they know how to communicate is on social media and try to get them involved that way as well so gabe uh you would like uh 
Russell Reed to provide you with a periodically, maybe once a quarter, once a twice a year, maybe a, a list of who our current members are. Ideally, we would have actually. I would. I would have thought by now that that would have been part of the report we get, saying here's how many. Here's how many supporting members we have. And at least we have an idea of what that is. I, we haven't a clue. I, I have not heard mm -hmm. a thing since I joined the board or even started visiting. Um, how many people we have involved? I would like to know. It would be a good idea for us to know so we can focus our efforts on maybe they're all clustered in an area. Maybe they're. Gabe. Yeah. Let me dig through my email because I think somebody sent me that mailing list. I think Russell sent me that mailing list and I sent it to the printer. To do oh, the printing. Okay, so I was. So I think I have that in my file. Well, are or those actual at one point, or is that a mailing list? Yeah. Well, that's. Oh, yeah, that's a mailing list. I don't know how many are members. Yeah, if, if if it was if it wasn't a purchase list of the community, it was a, just a member list of people that at, may have or may not have actually been supporting members, or or currently are. I mean, at least it's a start. Yeah, I don't know if it if it yeah. delin delineates that, but I can pull it open and look. I don't I mean, know if Russell put just, a star by them or highlighted them or anything. It just makes sense for us to have like a list. We can sort of by first, last name and address and we can get at least some sort of demographic in there of what we are actually looking at. And so we can better target the messaging so we can stay more involved in the community in, in a more intelligent way, a little more deliberate way. We're not a huge <laughs> community. So fortunately it's gonna be, you know, small potatoes compared to, you know, you know a big city, but and we have, do we have any clue about how many people in the Summit Waller community, roughly households? Yeah, there's 5,000 some odd yeah. households. Okay. That, that's mm -hmm. good to know. So if we, if, we, mm -hmm. if we could set a target for trying to approach at least all of them and then hopefully shoot for a number of, let's get a third of those as supporting members and get them involved somehow. I think we can all do a little bit better and that way we won't have to struggle to find an artist for utility boxes or mm -hmm. clean, up, clean up people for a wall or other roads down the road and so when people will start going on next door which is all they do is just whine and complain on that one <laughs> is um you know when they all ask what's going on with the canyon road can't they do this stuff at different times and you know it's like hey we have the project stuff on our website you should go check yeah. it out yeah join the conversation on facebook while you're at it you know so that way we can all stay you know if, if there was a better platform than that, I would definitely be talking about that, but there's really not, unfortunately. Um, you get the good and the bad with that. So yeah, trying to trying to trying to make sure that the most number of people in our community are able to in the know. And I mean, also, you know, I know Angela and I try to keep the the, the group and Facebook tight around the actual Summit Waller, so we're not trying to you know go all the way down to. 176 and all the way up into five where we're really trying to keep it very focused on on who joins the group so mm -hmm. it stays very very local so we don't have the bleed over of all the extra you know stuff going on beyond what we even can see or do or control so are you thinking maybe a more static website and uh more of the update kind of things on facebook or you want to try to say this event's coming up go check it out in our news update well yeah kind of a combination of the two so we like, okay. like Anna was saying we actually post the static information on the website so you're not answering person after person after person or trying to have multiple people say the same thing you have one person ideally it would be whoever's heading up in our in our board um that way it's a little more directed so it may, maybe john jumps in or you know for for the or who know Russell would jump in about the um, the, the cleanup, you know, the, the adopter road, and then Larry could talk about uh, community effort to clean up Orange Gate because that's you know you know let's face it that's his pet. I mean he's raised that that park since it was formed, so you know things like that, and that would also help you guys stay involved and become the person, the go-to person, and answer the questions that you know I might not know, so I'm going to have to bounce it off Larry, and it's a back and forth that's unnecessary when we can actually all stay. You know, a little bit more involved and, and have a little bit more of a, um, a public base you know but the, here's the board not just a list of names on the website that only two people actually talk about yeah that's why when parks has updates of tiff i always say i always ask tiffany please post it 
people are tired of hearing from me. People are tired of hearing from you, Gabe. They want, you know, that's, it helps to have multiple people contributing to the content uh, of the group rather than just the two of us sending people elsewhere. So even if you get tired of hearing your favorite artist sing the same song, you actually want to hear other music as well. So if uh, I were to create a Facebook page and account and be accepted into the Summit Waller Community Association Facebook group, then I could post things on. Yes, yeah, you, you'd be able to post things on Facebook group, you'd be able to answer questions that people might have, you know, and just be able to also see what people are saying and, and what their concerns are about what's going on. There's, there's a lot of great conversation going on. And um, I, I think it's, it's not like a lot of other ones where people get out of control with politics and pro. Every and once in a while, I have to turn off the commenting yeah. because people go a little sideways recent, recently that happened. And so you just, but for the most part, people are. Yeah. And, and also, it would be nice, though, having multiple people on there in the board, because if Angela and I aren't, aren't actually able to see the what's going on actively at the time and you see something going sideways, you can hit us up and say, hey, hey, something's going on there. You don't have to be admins of the thing. That's 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 more than we're not asking for that. But mm -hmm. you can at least let us know and say, oh, yeah, things are getting a little bit out of control in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And so we can then put a quicker, you know, we're trying to keep it accessible for everybody. We don't want it somebody some group feeling left out just because they have a difference of opinion yeah. i think dan's going to ask something he keeps on applauding mm -hmm. yes <laughs> i um i was once in the head of the website you know that was a real joke gabe i just have to tell you that you're doing a fantastic job and i'm, I'm very impressed and i think what we need to do and i'm gonna start with myself i think we need to um one of two things, supply Gabe with material for the Facebook, which I'm not a member. I hope to be soon. And secondly, to find a way for us individually to start putting things on there. We're all really good about bringing things onto the agenda. Mm -hmm. Discuss at this forum here tonight. Larry talks about Orange Gate. Mm -hmm. Bob talks about historical things. I talk about this or that. We all talk about something at this forum. But I think in addition to that, it might be a good idea if we could find a way, and I'm going to maybe call Gabe to see how to, how to do this, to be able to present something on Facebook. And then maybe Gabe could put it on the website. I today went on Facebook. I'm not a member, but I saw, I think Angela's a little warning. You shall be good. You shall not do this and that. I, I assume that came from Angela. I don't know, or Gabe or somebody, but it oh, was the a group rules. Group rules. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know who created those. I think they might be cookie cutter, but yeah. That was me. That was you? I thought that was good. Yeah. Because I, I copied and pasted and modified from the Midland Matters group, actually, for the group yeah. rules. Well, yeah. I, thought, I thought that was good. But yeah. I think we should follow Gabe's lead, really. And in addition to bringing things to the agenda like we're doing tonight, like Larry, mm -hmm. Bob, and I, we should. Put things on Facebook, or if you can't do Facebook like I can't, at least get it to Gabe. And I, I, I talked months ago, several months ago, about putting on things on the website or the to get it to Gabe about the Pialop tribe, their history, their culture, uh, some of the background on that, as well as our letter that we wrote as a board to get it on Facebook. I haven't done that, and I, I commit to have that done by the end of the month. And Gabe, I may give you a call to find out how to do that. I'll probably just give it give it to you and let you handle it first. Put it in as a Word doc, and you can send that to me. I can put I can just use that as you know, put it straight on the website, and then that way, somebody else but me or Angela might be able to get on there and say, "Hey, Dan, here, our part of our, our part of our board is actually put together this great thing," and then we can mm -hmm. then link to it. Uh, ideally, again, like I said, we need more voices to actually promote what we got going on. So just just for you non-Facebook people that have never ever touched Facebook, you create an account, you say, Angela or Gabe, I just created an account when here's my, you know, here's, you know, we look you up, we find you, we add you to the, the Facebook group. We, you skip all the extra stuff. We trust you. So <laughs> you don't have to, we don't have to vet you already again. We add you to the group. And then as long as you don't subscribe and like to a whole bunch of other stuff outside of the group, the only thing you're going to see is that group information. And mm -hmm. you know, and you can decline every single ridiculous request for friends from people from high school and college and you know, <laughs> your other, and you can just ignore all those things and just, you're only going to focus on this for this purpose, then you're good. If you want to step out of there, fine, but you don't, you don't have to. If, and I think that's a lot of fear people have, they're going to get into the 
the messiness of that Facebook can become. It, it's only as messy as you let it be. I mean, if Don Massey has a Facebook account, yeah, you can too, Dan. He brought it up to me. Yeah, he actually brought it up to me. <laughs> I picked up some lumber from him. Um, um, and he's enjoying some IPA now, I'm sure. Um, but he was saying, he said, you know, the whole time Larry was uh, on uh, as president, he was on a Facebook once. And now, again, we have Bob and he's not on Facebook. So you know, and even Don's on Facebook. I mean, he's like, he, he said, even I'm on Facebook. He's like, I don't say much. But at least I'm on there, so I know what's going on. So you know, it's part part of him you know, saying that kind of spurred me on a little bit to bring it back up again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to bag on non Facebook people. It's because I hate it. I, I agree with you guys not wanting to be on it, but at the same time, it is how people communicate locally. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, do you feel good with where we are right now, as far as? Your concerns, what you needed, or do we need to discuss something else? So over this next month, before the next meeting, um, ha- keep in your mind, what would you like the website to be? And we can bring it back up and say, I'd like the website to be more like this. We can't solve it all right now, yeah, obviously. But some ideas, what you'd like to do with it. I, I tried doing the uh, Instagram. It, it fizzled. Nothing happened. So that's fine. You know, we got zero, <laughs> zero, <laughs> except for the picture behind me and well, not not this week, but the one that Angela's had up there before. Yeah. The two pictures I've posted up there, and you know, my wife's <laughs> these are my wife's behind me. But it, it no, it didn't go anywhere. But hey, it was worth a try to try to get people involved. And I thought maybe we got some younger people because they're Instagrammers and they go out and take pictures and maybe they're hiking or walking and they see something cool in the community. Hey, it wouldn't be nice to have that posted on there to automatically populate the website. But yeah, it didn't work as well as I'd hoped. You know, we got to hire a uh, an influencer. Yeah, I know. We need to make our own. <laughs> There's social media companies out there that actually feed into your, your stuff and drive traffic to you, but we're not trying oh, to. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. And buy you I, friends and all yeah. sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually actually know a few people that are social media managers. Well, those those are extremes, but, you know, but I actually do know some people that actually increase the presence of somebody on Facebook and the web. And so people get more uh, knowledge of it. But we're not looking to attract people from everywhere. We just want the locals. Okay. But, yeah. All right. Well, I guess we yeah. got our assignment for next month. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, Larry, we're running a little bit late with our uh, county presentation. Can you be quick with the uh, fireworks code? Yeah, in 2017, uh, uh, the Summer Waller Community Association was uh, instrumental in uh, getting a uh, fireworks uh, uh, code out there. Uh, didn't get much other than uh, uh, a $600 fine plus court uh, statutory fees of another $630 for violators. Um, but now we have a, a new proposal to amend uh, our original one. I think Chelsea can back me up here on this that Proposal number 2021-79. What I like about it is it, it, it narrows down when you can shoot off fireworks to just the 4th of July, which was one of our original proposals. And uh, also at the end of the year, it's uh, that last day of the year into the early hours of uh, January 1st. And... Uh, it's sponsored by two Republicans, Dave Morrell and Janny Hitchin, and Ryan Melno, a Democrat, and Derek Young, a Democrat. So two Republicans and two Democrats are trying to upgrade the uh, fireworks code. And uh, I uh, made a phone call to Chelsea, uh, left a message about, I wonder where uh, Marty Campbell stands on this uh, proposal. and. Uh, the date of the final hearing is going to be uh, September 21st. And uh, so, Chelsea, uh, where's Marty Campbell on this uh, new proposal? Um, I haven't talked to him explicitly about this, but I believe he is in favor of it because he has been working pretty diligently on um, the on reducing the impact of fireworks, particularly because of the impacts it has in unincorporated Pierce County, especially with our agriculture and farms. So I know um, I, 
assume he would be voting in favor of it, especially because it is bipartisan. I just want to be careful to not speak for him because he hasn't, ex we haven't explicitly discussed this, but um, he has been, been working hard on finding solutions to make sure that we're reducing fireworks, especially for veterans and animals, pets and vets. Well, I, I, I appreciate you commenting on that uh, because uh, going through all the whereases, um, I mean, they address the farm animal situation, the dogs, uh, trank, you know, the medicating uh, uh, farm animals concern. Uh, I think this is a great step forward. And I think that uh, our president should uh, uh, email uh, the council members shortly before uh, September the 21st, uh, you know, in favor of this uh, proposal 2021-79. And I would like to make a motion uh, that uh, we uh, we do that. Second. Discussion on the motion. Yeah. Is there a second? Yeah, well, discussion, yeah. So discussion okay. just real quickly was, um, the last ordinance was great, you know, to have an ordinance, an ordinance to begin with, but if there's no enforcement, it, it's kind of pointless. So is there something that's gonna change about the enforcement? Because making rules doesn't matter if there's no enforcement of the rules. So that, that, that's, my only thing. that's my only thing. It points out that the fire, yeah, your enforcement has been a big issue with this lack of enforcement. And I think the last 4th of July, the uh, Pierce County Sheriff said that, uh, you know, we, we just got bigger things to attend to. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to uh, enforcing the fireworks thing. Um, it, it It's an improvement. Uh, I, and I know that, uh, you know, enforcement is going to be an issue for a lot of things, and it's going to be an issue for this as well in the going, going forward. But at least we have um, some improvements that we asked for originally way back in 2016, 17, uh, that now have been recognized. And uh, it is a step forward. I agree with you, Gabe, that enforcement is gonna be a big deal. People's just gonna have to call the Sheriff's Department and see what happens. Now, is there anything in the language about when sales can happen? And I know that doesn't affect the tribes and most of what is really inheritant to community members and concern is the stuff that comes off of the reservation properties. But as far yeah, the, as... Yeah, the sale of uh, legal uh, fireworks uh, really doesn't change much at all. Uh, it's basically revolves around uh, the date and hours of when you can discharge uh, legal fireworks. Mm -hmm. uh, illegal fireworks are labeled as uh, dangerous. Yeah, dangerous fireworks are prohibited. So it's any unlawful, it is, an un, it is unlawful for any person to sell, possess, transport, use, or explode any fireworks classified as dangerous within unincorporated areas of the county. Um, there are some exceptions if you have a permit, of course. But, but um, just, just the date of sales is all I'm concerned with. Is there any yeah, tighten that up? Yeah, uh, no, not really. Okay, which kind of gets back to Gabe's question about yeah, well, if there's, there's not enforcement because you've got all these people who are sitting around with these fireworks, they're gonna light them off if they've got them in hand. Right, I, I understand that. Uh, let's see, they can, uh, sales and purchases are permitted um, noon to 11 p.m. on June 28th, from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. from June 29th, through okay, July so starting the starting on June 28th, they can sell through July 4th. Correct. Okay. So they've got a week. Yeah. Yep. Larry, was there anything in that that 
talked about the fire hazard with the lack of rain that we're having these years. It's getting worse and uh, worse. Yeah. This was yes. the first that, year I was concerned for my house during the holiday. Sure, so, so was I. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it says, whereas Pierce County is experiencing unprecedented record-breaking heat waves that are creating extreme fire risk conditions and that similar conditions are likely to occur in the future. And, I, and they've given the authority to the Pierce County Fire Marshal in con consultation with the Pierce County Executive to ban the discharge of consumer fireworks on an emergency basis in unincorporated Pierce County. Okay, is there any liability attached to people who might start fires? Well, uh, that becomes a criminal offense and uh, uh, that's subject to the uh, Washington State Revised uh, Code, RCW. So that's a criminal offense. Uh, Maybe. But if you are, if you are cited, you know, it, it still allows a sheriff deputy to write you a ticket, a citation. And this time around, it's a citation for every, it, like if you set off, uh, if, 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 if the deputy saw you shoot off like five different illegal uh, fireworks, he could cite you for each one of those. Sure, but who, I, I don't know, maybe it's easy if you live in a neighborhood to see who's setting off one, what, but in my type of rural area, backyard dan knows that we have the same backyard it's a bunch of trees and you see stuff come out from the neighborhoods you have no idea who's doing it but they're right. obviously illegal <laughs> and right. a fire hazard so well, i think it's important i think it's important to have these things on the books codified mm -hmm. because then you can start talking more about you have the basis to talk about more in the area of enforcement you know i i on July the 5th, I looked out my front, uh, I was out on my front lawn and I could see fireworks shooting up through the trees over on, around the corner on 46th, uh, which was kind of scary. Yeah. So the only thing that I could do, I, I, I called the sheriff, you know, 911. Uh, they immediately uh, said, is there a fire? And I said, no. And so they immediately transferred me to the non-emergency line and there was no pickup. Mm -hmm. Right. So what what was left to me was to get in my car, go around the corner, and get into a confrontation with with the people setting off the fireworks, which my wife advised me not to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't imagine why, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> just walk, just walk the neighborhood with a couple of fire extinguishers and immediately <laughs> douse people and their fireworks. I don't know. Well, sometimes when you start taking pictures with your cell phone, uh, that has an impact. Well, maybe we need to just rent some signage from the newly installed big lit up signs <laughs> and uh, okay. lead the case there. Well, so the bottom line is, the bottom line is, this is a, this is a big improvement, not so much with enforcement, but with codification of our original uh, 2017-15 that passed uh, in 2017, went into effect uh, in 2018. Now, I think that uh, this will not go into effect next year's 4th of July, mm -hmm. well, uh, uh, we'll New Year's celebration, because it's got to go, it's got to wait a year. Mm -hmm. So well, if Pat, let's say it passes in September, it's got to go a whole year before it goes into effect. Yeah, most of this is sort of, yeah, if it gives the fire marshal the authority to say, we have a fire hazard, there will be no setting off of fireworks. Mm -hmm. If he actually has that authority, there's something worthwhile coming out of this. Yeah, there's still the $600 uh, initial citation plus well, statutory Larry, fees. None of that matters. If he has, he either has the authority or he doesn't, if we are in a high fire situation again. Right, he has the authority. Okay, well then that's something positive out of this. 
Yeah, and and saying that you can only discharge fireworks on the 4th of July and uh, December 31st uh, is a step forward as well. And every Seahawks game. <laughs> right. And your birthday. <laughs> So oh, by the way, the, Mar the Mariners the Mariners lost tonight five to four uh, in the bottom of the ninth. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Larry, <laughs> would you repeat that again? Uh, I move that uh, that the uh, Summerwaller Community Association support proposal number 2021-79, uh, a revision of the Pierce County Code labeled fireworks. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Um, hey, I have a question, you. Larry. You said something about writing a letter, but that was not what you just said. Uh, I would, I would urge. Uh, I didn't want that to be a part of the uh, the motion, but I, I would okay. encourage. Gotcha. Uh, uh, Bob to, uh, which he did last time we had a proposal that we were. I'm authorized. Okay. Yeah, Bob is authorized to uh, email each of the uh, Pierce County Council people to uh, support that. Now, in a current vein, I'm going to go back up to something I forgot about with current business. One of the reasons I had the development committee hearing on the agenda is that they will be doing basically a yay or a nay on the proposal from County Parks for what to do with Orange Gate. It's certainly not everything that this organization had hoped for or Larry and other folks had hoped for when the county first purchased the land. And there are pieces that I wish it were different personally, but I really think all in all, it's a reasonably solid plan to provide for the needs of a diverse community. Um, I will be, I would be speaking on my own behalf anyway. Uh, what I'm asking for right now though, is authorization to speak on behalf of the group in support of this plan. I second that. Is that by consensus? We um, do we have consensus on it? Any op opposition? How about a show of hands? Okay, then I will speak in support of it. Um, again, there are some pieces that are still missing, but all in all, I think it does support the communities, the many different communities that we have within our area. Okay, announcements. John, you want to talk about Adopter Road? Well, it is on. It is, oh, it is on. It is the 18th of this month, just uh, Saturday away, uh, Saturday after this coming. And we could use uh, any help if you spread the word, show up on Saturday morning. Um, that's about it. The equipment's ordered. We're ready to go. Nice. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. And Larry, uh, PC Council meeting. Yeah, uh, I I think Chelsea can uh, address this, uh, but on the 30th. Oh, yes. so, uh, yeah, Chelsea, you want to talk about the 30th at uh, Harvard Elementary? Oh my God, I would love to. So coming up on Thursday, September 30th, at 6 p.m., we have our District 5 in-district council meeting. This is going to be a dual language meeting in Spanish and English. It's going to be the first time a council meeting has ever been in Spanish and English because Harvard is an immersion school and we want to really uplift and honor and engage community members who haven't traditionally had access to government. Um, there's going to be fresh and free vegetables from the farm there as well hopefully a new crosswalk but we've been waiting on that so it's just going to be an experience from the moment you cross the beautiful crosswalk pick up some veggies 
come in, hear from some the council members, opportunity for public comment. There will be some community updates there about resources and things happening in the community. So that is going to be September 30th, 6 p.m., Harvard Elementary School in Midland. It's going to be just a breathtaking meeting, guaranteed or your money back. Yeah, I would like to add that uh, those meetings I've attended, every one of them the last several years, and they're relatively designed to be short. Marty Campbell will be the honorary chair. Um, the, the business of the meeting will go by pretty quickly. And uh, I would encourage, since it is the closest location for a District 5 uh, evening meeting that I think has ever been, well, not there. we did have one at the Mid-County Community Center. That's the closest, but this is really close. So it's close to where we live. I would encourage as many of the accounts of the uh, uh, some of all the community association board members to be there because this is an opportunity for our community association to show support for our Pierce County Council uh, person. And it, I believe it helps in our relationship. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, that, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I taught there about 20 years ago and that new school is just gonna be wonderful for that community. Um, those kids deserve that. Okay. Um, well, it's now almost 10 after nine. We've gone quite long, but fortunately we don't have to drive home tonight. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Just one last oh, one thing. More thing. I'm right. sorry. Just um, one small, small yes. thing, um, but, but big in, in concept. So my business networking group that I meet with weekly, uh, we are in the process of migrating towards in person again. We've been on Zoom for a year and a half can we take a not not now but can we take a a month to like each one of us mull it over and maybe look at what timeline might make sense for us to start approaching the idea of going back to life mm -hmm. um and you've been reading my mind Gabe I would just like <laughs> to put that out there it'd be great to see some people in, in person and you know we tend to be a little bit more timely I think we don't <laughs> when we're actually having to go someplace too but um but just, just something to keep it's an idea. Maybe next uh, next month we can actually discuss that a little bit more. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. I'll put that on the agenda. Anything else for the good of the order? Do we have a motion? So moved. So moved. <laughs> and looks like we have multiple seconds. And it's been moved <laughs> the second we adjourn. All in favor? Hi. Bye. Hi. Hi. See you all next month. Thanks, right, guys. Thanks. Thanks. See ya. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody.